All right. Welcome, everyone, to the first presentation of the year from DBA Fundamentals. Today, we're talking with Pavel about the modern, day, modern data warehouse using Azure Synapse Analytics. So as it is, you just heard, we're having our speaker today is Pavel Potensky. Potashinsky, I'll get that right one of these days, hopefully. All right, today is January 10th, 2023. Thank you all for joining us as always. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, the upper right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the three leaders of the DBA Fundamentals Group, Steve Cantrell, Shane O'Neill, and myself, Kevin Wilkie. Uh, to, our, to the right-hand side of our names, you'll see our Twitter handles. So if you ever need to get hold of us, that's the easiest way to do it. Below that is our many forms of social media where you can see and get hold of us and talk to us and ask all kinds of fun and wonderful questions. Uh, the first one on the list is Meetup, where probably most of you actually saw today's uh, Meetup and actually uh, any of our upcoming uh, presentations. Hopefully you signed up there as well. Below that is our website, dbafund.org, where we put all of our future presentations as well as our, our archive of many years of actual presentations as well. Um, yeah. Below that is uh, dbafundtube.com. It is, as one of my friends calls it, the best, best place for DBA on the web. Um, mainly says that just because there is so much of our past presentations we have on there where we've uh, copied all of our presentations we've ever, uh, most of them we've ever done um, in the past. And uh, if you'll just hit the like and subscribe button on there, you'll be you'll be known you'll know when we have the latest uh, presentation out there, which is usually a couple of days after uh, the presentation happens, or at least that's what we try for. Uh, so with that, also if you see below below it, there is our Twitter handle, which is at DBA Fun, and our Slack channel, and last but not least, least our actual LinkedIn channel for our group, where we have all kinds of conversations going on. Uh, it, as we said earlier, today's session is being recorded and it's usually available within one to two days. Be sure to check us out on dbafuntube.com. Uh, just a reminder, please be sure to turn off your camera and to mute yourself uh, so that we can actually all pay attention to our presenter today because Pavel actually deserves every bit of presentation, every every time we can actually look and see this greatness he's put together. And also, if you have any questions, be sure to type it into our chat window. And with that, here is a small autobiography of Pavel, um, just telling how great he is and whatnot. So with that, Pavel, over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin, and so thank you for for the invitation to this, to this great user group, uh, pretty much crowded here. You set up the expectations. <laughs> let me just quickly share my screen, and let me let me know once you see it. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, cool. So um, maybe a quick introduction. I'm not that far from DBAs uh, historically, at least. I used to be a DBA in the past. I used to work as a SQL Server developer as, as well. However, let's say 12 years ago, I switched more towards analytics. So I started playing with things like analysis services, reporting services, uh, Tableau, Power BI over time. And right now I moved completely to Azure stuff and I'm sitting here at Microsoft uh, as one of the program managers uh, in the Azure Synapse Analytics product team. Actually, my, my responsibility is to uh, handle community engagements. So presentations to the user groups is a part of my job, actually. Um, I'm, but I'm, I'm based in Poland, which is uh, which is quite far from you, probably. Uh, it's 6 p.m. of my time right now, so uh, it's evening. So apologies if I if I if I'm if I'm you know, sound a bit tired. It may be it may be the case. So <clears throat> today's topic is modern data warehouse using Azure Synapse Analytics. Actually, this topic is a bit tricky because lots of people got away from the from the 
naming modern data warehouse. Rather, people uh, people describe uh, things that I will show you today as modern data platforms, uh, because warehouses they still are a part of those platforms, but uh, it's not it's not the whole the whole the whole story of of, the, of Synapse for sure. You may find me on Twitter and LinkedIn if you're interested in connecting. So feel free to uh, to join my network on LinkedIn. I'm actually I, I have a little newsletter uh, running on a monthly basis uh, on LinkedIn. So if you're if you're wondering uh, what's new in uh, in Azure Data and Power BI world, that may be a good newsletter for you. Um, okay, so the agenda is as follows. First, I will try to introduce what what uh, what what's the what's the challenge about analytics right because uh we do we do it for, for a purpose uh i will i will elaborate on what what we observed over the over the years when we when we struggled with different different uh, different kinds of analytics and then i will move to uh how synapse tries to answer those concerns and challenges and then i will try to demonstrate it so let's hope that demo goats demo goats will be with me with me today because most of my demos will be live so um yeah i will not demonstrate super sophisticated demos but some sql knowledge is required probably as well as some basic python knowledge um, would be useful as well with that let me let me go through the presentation uh, I think some someone is not muted. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the first the first question is what do we have what do we have uh, in terms of challenges uh, when we work with data? So first of all, there is still a challenge of getting the data from storing it to getting value out of it. The first question, what data do I have? It, it appears that people do not use the data the organization have in place. Um, some some people say that only 15% of data is actually used by the by your by the organizations. So that leads to a, to a question: how to handle governance discovery better than we used to do it in the past. Second, is the data trustworthy? Can I can I trust my data? Can I trust what what actually uh, comes out of it? The insights because analytics is. is all about the insights. We want to get value from data to get some some uh, some outcome. Like what what should I do to increase performance of my organization, for example? Now, another question: Can people access the data they need to make their decisions? And this is this is another buzzword, another another after modern data warehouse called data democratization. So we actually have more and more users willing to access the data and it's a challenge because every single time we grant access to the data to data to someone we have to take care about permissions we have to take care about several layers of permissions usually so um, it's always a challenge also people what people tend to uh, tend to request for faster business insights what what, what does it mean actually it means that, that between the time that the data appears in in the operational or transactional systems and the insights that should get out of the data, the time is getting much shorter. Historically, historically, if you look at data warehousing projects, they took even years. Today, if you look at the at the analytic, analytical projects, they, they 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 take months at most at most, and most of them actually bring the first the first meaningful value. Uh, after several weeks or even days, and the last, the last, the last big point is compliance and also uh, security. But in terms of external security, so we don't want to expose the data, but also we want to stick to the rules. And the rules, we are getting more and more rules, like you know ESG reporting last time, for example. Um, so, actually, that was the purpose for a thing that Microsoft created uh, last year, Microsoft Intelligent Data Platform. I wanted to start with, you know, um, solving this riddle because people struggle with uh, guessing what actually this Microsoft Intelligent Data Platform is. So 
this you may consider Microsoft Intelligent Data Platform as a power platform for data. So we, we basically take every services, all, all services and, and products that handle with handle the handle data management and analytics uh, as one bucket. Integrate them as well as possible to make to make this the holistic story for, for data uh, easier for customers. So we take operational operational databases like SQL Server, Azure SQL, and so forth. Analytics like Synapse, Power BI, and data governance like Microsoft Purview, and try to try to integrate them as close as possible. It also means that we do some reorgs, but it's not it's not the topic for today's session. Now, every every single company follows the pattern of maturity in terms of where where they are in uh, with analytics typically uh, every, every organization starts with answering simple question what happened so they take historical data and they try to understand what's what's the reality in the past that helps but it's 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 uh, it's not enough because typically we we want to at least understand why did things happen so we get insights or let's say some outcomes because we want to learn and we want to push the organization forward. Now, if I was if I was about to talk about traditional data warehouses, they were here. So I would put bold red line here and tr and traditional data warehouse is somewhere here. If we if we want to go go further because we want we, we can go further with data with analytics. We have, so we can, for example, play with predictive analytics, machine learning, deep learning. So predict what will happen in the future because we have historical data and somehow we can uh, we can get insights uh, on what's going to happen in the future or at least have some probability of things that, that will happen in the, in the future. So this is the next step, predictive analytics and the AI, right? And uh, then the last step is actually it's interesting because people sometimes forget about it, which is kind of kind of obvious obvious step. It's prescriptive analytics, which is all about going from from insights to actions. So, in ideal case, my analytical system should allow me to uh, to to launch or or maybe uh, maybe trigger some actions in the in the company. That that can be a flow. That can be a, an, an operation that. For example, will fulfill my my warehouse, not data warehouse, but just warehouse. Uh, so, you know, it's not just about bringing the data to the screens of people that need the information, but also uh, to 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 start to start doing something to 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 improve the performance and 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 the operations I have in my company. So, the challenge is that historically. Each of those points of maturity required different systems for analytics. And that was the challenge because, because it, it was complex. It is still, it's, it's still complex. I mean, we still follow the same patterns as 20 years ago, I would say. So we typically, the challenge, the first challenge is, hey, my company has, a, has lots of systems to integrate. So I have data sources. Even worse, even worse, because right now the systems are not just on-premises. Historically, I used to have a bunch of SQL Server databases to integrate. Right now, it's not just SQL Server; it can be also Azure, AWS, Google, uh, some some software as a service uh, applications, and I have to integrate all those all those systems. So, data integration is the first step. So, I typically this 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 step is uh, it, it takes two parts. For the first one is data ingestion. So I get the data from the systems. In the cloud era, it's typical that data ingestion is the very first step of everything. So we extract and load the data in the cloud as fast as possible. Every single cloud vendor follows this pattern and Microsoft also follows this pattern. So that's why the immediate step after data ingestion is actually storing the data in some storage, typically data lake. So uh, historically, we tend to store pretty much everything in relational databases. Right now, object 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 storages uh, actually 
are taking over and they, they store made the majority of data. The good question is whether it's effective and whether the data is effectively used of, uh, over time, but it's just another question. So after, after we have the data, we might use different techniques to transform the data. So it's still a part of integration and then build maybe a warehouse or maybe something else. Maybe, maybe not, maybe not the warehouse. There is, there are different concepts like, for example, lake house. So let's build some kind of mix of data warehouse and lake and data lake and, and, and combine those two into a lake house. And then we have reporting. So the, first, the very first step after we have the, the standardized storage. So data warehouse was always about bringing standardized form of, uh, of the enterprise data and make it ready for consumption. So we consume the data using different BI platforms. Uh, most of most of big biggest biggest organizations in the world they do they do not have a single BI and reporting platform. They they tend to have um, even dozens of them because for for example for, for historical reasons. But anyway, we can use for example Power BI uh, to to organize our our reporting to bring insights uh, for, for for users, right? And also to make something called self-service analytics available for the users. So it's not just the case that IT people handle all of those steps, but also but also business users or citizen developers, like, like we sometimes call them, they also have their piece of cake here. And there are also other, other things like, for example, data science, so this predictive analytics. Once we have the data at least curated, curated if not standardized, we can go and Take them from take this data from data lake or data warehouse to uh, to get to experiments and maybe produce some some predictive models and then enrich the data uh, that we get from history with some predictions. So this is actually the pattern that that we used in history. It's not different. The difference is here. I mean, this 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 beginning is different because right now we land in a data lake for most cases. Okay, now this brings this brings silos because if you look at uh, how 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 much how much how many how many different pieces of technology it involves, it always brings silos. So silos in terms of data technology and people. Data well, actually, not everything is relational. So you have data complexity. Different data come in a different variety, velocity, volume, whatever. You have to deal with uh, databases, uh, JSON files, uh, different formats, NoSQL databases, and maybe even binary files like images or, or, or movies, right? Videos. Technology, because people, well, come on, let's be honest. People, people, typically people learn one technology as their core technology, and maybe some other technologies as, as secondary, right? I, historically, I was SQL Server guy, so I, I know perfectly how deep people can go with technology uh, and you know become an expert on, on a single technology. But that also, but that, that also brings us to silos because, for example, for data science, I would use different platform than for storing data, data in relational database. And then people, this is a, actually religious discussion of of how to deal with this problem. IT people versus business people. You know, every single analytical platform should be actually dedicated to business people. But it is typical that it's it's actually up to IT people to maintain those systems and, and also to develop them. So it's it's actually a hard topic to discuss. I'm not going to cover that, but it's also a case that we have to leverage between uh, discussion about technology and the business because analytical projects they, they they often fail because they don't bring the enough business value that's that's the problem so uh, my 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 approach typic, my typical approach to analytical analytical projects is get business on board as as soon as possible at least some meaningful stakeholders and keep them engaged on, a, on every step keep them updated and let them know what's what's going on what are the updates because the sooner they discover the value, the, 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 the better the better advocacy you will get in, in, in the business. Okay, enough of this business talk. 
Now let's switch to technology. So actually, Azure Synapse Analytics is a kind of answer of Microsoft to this to this challenge of you know silos, um, complex processes like start go from ingestion to uh, to well organized data that can be consumed by different different people, business users in BI, data scientists, uh, data scientists in their experiments and so forth. So what actually is Azure Synapse? If you go from the bottom, it starts with a data lake. So the very, the very, the very first baseline of Azure Synapse is always data lake. It starts here. We we try to we try to ingest most of our data here. But it also it's also the case that you can use different techniques. I will discuss it in a, in a second. That not that do not rely only on data lake, but on some other techniques to bring data to Synapse. The second part is actually uh, the set of analytic analytic runtimes. There are four of them. Two SQL runtimes. I will discuss them in a second. So yes, SQL, the SQL language, SQL databases. Those are here. There is Apache Spark Spark runtime, which it is well known from you know big data world and open source world. And there is Data Explorer, which is for so-called observational analytics. You may find Data Explorer as, as, as a standalone pro product in Azure. So actually, I will not discuss Data Explorer, but just for you to, to know, this one is for log and telemetry analytics. So whenever you deal with uh, data that, that comes quickly and has to be analyzed in large volumes in place, this is a great solution for you. Every single runtime is connected to the data lake, some of them exchange the metadata between themselves. So they actually can influence how uh, how different people having different skills can work. On top of that, we also have in data integration. So things that allow, allow us to orchestrate how data flows through the system. We have some management and monitoring stuff that allows us to, for example, answer, answer questions what are the uh, currently running queries in, in the runtime? And also some centralized security and DevOps, which allows you to organize um, things like uh, permissions, roles, et cetera, right? So this can be actually integrated well with other services. And you will see over time that it is well integrated with Power BI, but also it is well integrated with Purview. I will not show you integration with Purview, but uh, just for you to know, in Synapse Studio, which is a UI for Synapse, you can easily use Microsoft Purview once it's once once it's set up in the environment. You can use Purview to find to search for objects, for tables, files, and etc. So that's that's actually Synapse Analytics. It brings end-to-end -end experience for analytics, starting from ingestion and data integration through data warehousing and lake housing ending up to with even even data science and presenting the data to different systems like BI. Okay, so it, it actually contains those, those blocks. We will integrate data, we'll do some data engineering, data exploration, data warehousing and lake housing, maybe data science, and things that I will not cover will be observational analytics uh, and governance. Those two I will uh, abandon today. Okay, so uh, before I start with, the, with, with demos, uh, why data lake? Why, do, why, why the world of, of, of cloud switch to data lake for analytics? The reasons are the following. First of all, uh, it's the pattern that allows analytics to become cheaper because it's, it's, it's an object store that is let's say the base the baseline service in every single cloud it can be cheap it can be cost effective right so you can uh, you can use different layers and pay less for your data while storing st while storing it in let's say archive mode for example it's redundant so uh, actually there is no need to, for you to uh, handle things like some some basic basic um, um, disaster recovery right uh, actually, if you create storage with uh, with a zone or geo-replicated uh, feature enabled, then you will then you will uh, have quite secure quite secure storage uh, that will 
that will have that, that will have the redundancy on uh, you know multiple levels. It's typically fast for analytics and, and great for performance of ingestion. So you can easily load the data into this uh, into this uh, storage and then uh, then move it move it forward to different layers of your analytical systems. And it can be also easily consumed by different t different tools. It's not just BI tools, but also big data tools like Spark, like Hadoop, and, and so forth. Now, in Azure, the, there is actually one one storage that that you should use for your uh, for your big for your data lake uh, solutions, and it's Azure Data Lake Storage Generation Two. Period. The difference between standard storage and this one is actually here. Hierarchical namespace. Which means that in this storage, data is stored in folders that can be secured using uh, two layers of security: role-based access control, so typical roles like storage storage blob contributor, and ACLs, so uh, the, the, the typical typical uh, permissions, read permission, write permission, and so forth. So just like you would have file system, right? And, uh, and that's actually the, the big advantage of, of this storage because that allows you to easily pass through uh, pass through the uh, you know the, the, the things the things behind security uh, from a different analytical system to to the storage itself. Now let's go to Azure Synapse Analytics and let's let's quickly check how you could create create one. If you if you have an Azure subscription, so once you once you are in an Azure portal, the easiest way to start to start playing with Synapse is basically find Azure Synapse Analytics and then click create. I will not create the new the new the new work, workspace for Synapse. I will just guide you through the most important attributes of it. So you all you have to do is to select resource group which is no, nothing more but just logical logical bucket for resources in azure uh, give the the workspace a meaningful name and and here is import, an important thing every single synapse workspace has has a, has a data lake attached so you will not start the workspace without without spinning up or having ready data lake storage generation too so the file system is required. You, you will you will use it not only for storing the data, but also for storing some internal synapse metadata. And that's basically it. Once you once you have this those three attributes in place and the region, of course, which uh, which uh, should be close to your location and probably uh, in the location where every every other Azure uh, resource is stored for the for the specific project, then you're good to go. I already have uh, my my synapse synapse uh, workspace ready. So let me start and show you how this looks like from the user perspective. So once you click on the synapse workspace, there is a single button open synapse studio, which allows you to open the UI, the web UI for uh, accessing everything that you have in your synapse workspace. Okay, so now the the UI is organized in something called hubs. There are six hubs, as you can see here. Um, so home is something that allows that allows me to quickly start and learn. Data, this will be the place when I will have databases and my data lake to, to explore. In develop, I will develop SQL scripts and notebooks, and maybe some other stuff. In integrate, I will create pipelines which will be my flows of how i orchestrate how i orchestrate things like ingestion and data transformations and monitoring and manage are more administrative tasks so for example monitoring uh, how how my uh, analytical runtimes are uh, busy or what what kind of queries are running on top of my sql database and, and so forth while manage can uh, can actually uh, allow you to create additional uh, and additional compute power, uh, additional analytical runtimes, as well as manage security and other stuff. Okay, so this is the very beginning of uh, of Synapse. Now let's let's go by by uh, step by step. The, the first the first step is to ingest the data. So before I start an analyzing data and building my warehouse or whatever I want to build with this with the system, I need I need to get the data into the system. And this is actually uh, this is being done by, by pipelines. 
pipelines remind very much uh, the Azure data serve Azure data factory service from Azure. So if you're familiar with Azure data factory, the look and feel of pipelines is very much like ADF. There are some differences which are well well described in the doc documentation. If you ask me about what which which of them is is more mature or let's let's say have more options, there are a couple of options in Azure Data Factory that are missing in Synapse pipelines, but typically they do not hold they do not hold customers from um, they do not stop customers from from playing with pipelines and uh, organizing the environment. Now there are over 100 connectors to different data sources, both on premises and cloud. So you are able to connect, for example, to SQL Server on prem to Azure SQL, to different non-Microsoft databases like Postgre, MySQL, uh, different clouds like AWS or Google Cloud, and even different software as a service systems like Salesforce, for example. Now, the benefits of pipelines, you, you have ready to use loading pipe patterns. You have, you have uh, well, uh, well parameterized uh, um, environments. So you, you, you create activities like like ingestion from from source to sync, uh, typically to loading to to your data lake, but but the process can be done in parallel on multiple entities. I will show you that in a second because I have ready to use pipeline based on one SQL database. Now this is the graphical the development experience. So yes, you drag and drop things and then configure uh, the properties, and then. Everything is about orchestration, so it means you will you will be able to trigger your pipelines not only manually but also to put them in schedule. Um, things I will not show uh, is uh, is about data flows. Data flows are uh, can be can the data flow can be a part of of the pipeline. You can create. By dragging and dropping, you, could, you can create uh, uh, data data transformations. So you can, for example, take two data sources, join them, just like you would normally do it with SQL, aggregate them, and then write the result to the data lake. This is actually what this this particular data flow is doing. So it's it's actually a visual design, which can be executed in pipelines. It's behind powered by Apache Spark clusters, which means it can be expensive if you try to run it on top of small data sets. It's not advised to run it on small data. Rather, you should use it for some meaningful meaningful data transfers and transformations. But it offers act interactive de debugging. You can enable uh, interactive debugging and, uh, and have data preview in place, uh, pre preview the data after each step performed in this in this kind of data flow. Uh, okay, so let's see the pipeline in action. Now, the easiest the easiest way to actually ingest the data is to click on this ingest button in the home page. I will try to download a single file from the website that collects New York City uh, New York City open data, yellow taxi trip trip records. Let's say the file for January. I will copy the link, and then I will try to ingest this one. So. It actually offers me two options, simple built-in copy task. So let's copy from point A to point B, hopefully to my Synapse environment, or metadata-driven copy task. Metadata-driven, as you may expect, it, 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 it hosts some kind of metadata, like for example, the list of table you want to get from your SQL database. And then based on this metadata, it, it drives the pipeline. I will just run this simple built-in copy because I just want to bring some simple data to the lake, nothing else. So first I will, I will create a connection. Here you can see over 100 connections. The one that I'm looking for is HTTP because it's actually uh, an anonymous website. Let me call it HTTP server. I will paste my the link to the file here. The authentication is anonymous. Let's test the connection. And let's create it. So this is my connection to HTTP single file, right? Now, let's go further. Now the file format. I'm not going to detect file format. I'm going to say, hey, I know this is a parquet file. And I know it's probably a snappy compress. But for most of the data sources, 
this this wizard is able to uh, to get the information about the data the, about, about the data format and and for example parse the schema so um let's create a connection um the destination store i will use my default data lake and i will put the data in the sandbox which is my container for data that I will not use for some standard processes, but just to, to play with and, and explore. New York City, yellow taxi, that's it. And maybe trip small. Okay. As you can see, I only I also I already have one one file here, but hey, I will just use this opportunity to have the next file 202201. Okay. And it's also going to be parquet format. So nothing really sophisticated. I will not rename my, my pipeline. Let's just run it. So right now the, the wizard is finalizing things I clicked through. So I defined the source and destination and file formats and it creates a, a pipeline and it immediately runs the pipeline. So I can click actually finish. I can check whether there, whether this pipeline uh, was running or not. Uh, you can see that it's in progress. I switch to monitor to pipeline runs and I can see that copy pipeline is in progress. I can even see some details where we are and I can see how, how, how much data was transferred from one, one place to another. And uh, if, if I'm good, if this is succeeded, then I can switch to data hub to my linked tab and navigate to my data lake and search for the file that that was hopefully loaded into my data lake to sandbox. So I'm in a sandbox. As you can, as you probably remember, there is should there should be there's some New York City taxi uh, open data sets. Open data sets. Um, come on, New York City yellow taxi trip small and. Come on. And yes, this is my parquet file transferred, transferred from the web. So now if you want to build more sophisticated, because this, this pipeline was super easy. If you look at it from how it looks right now, it's just a source and the sync and the definition of, uh, of file formats. But you, can, but you can be more sophisticated. For example, this pipeline is that does actually two things. First, it gets a list of files, so something for the DBAs. It gets a list of files from Azure SQL database. And then it passes this list as a parameterized list to the for each for each uh, activity. And guess what? In for each activity, I copy every single table that is that uh, is found by this statement. I copied I copy the data from each of this of those tables to the data lake. So actually, it it is it, it, it what it, what this what this step is doing. It's in parallel. It in parallel copies the data from multiple tables, and the effect of that is that I have the data in my data lake. Let me switch to um, let me switch to uh, data in bronze layer this time. I have my Azure SQL, Azure SQL, and bunch of bunch of tables, each one collected into a single parquet file. This is not the big data set, but just for uh, showing you how you can parameterize it. So how this how this pipeline is parameterized? So as you can see, the first step is to write a query that will get the names of of tables, and then actually I have in the copy in the copy table to lake i have i'm passing i'm passing parameters so let me just maybe go to this one so here is the source as you can see there are two parameters being passed and which are which are uh, the items coming from this lookup so schema name and table name are being passed to this why, this param why those parameters show up here? Because in the data set that I defined on top of SQL database, there are two parameters created, schema and table name, 
and I and I pass those two parameters to collect table uh, two, two two parts table name schema and table name. So that's actually how I can easily parameterize downloading the a bunch of SQL SQL tables into my data lake with only two activities actually because I have lookup and the copy table in a for each for each loop. It's it's a great method of you know making your making your pipeline super super simple. It's 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 not that hard to manage those parameters over time. Um, so that's about that's about uh, the pipelines. Now, once we have the data in the in the lake, it's it's super easy. But imagine that you have dozens of systems like this uh, like the SQL database. What happens is actually the number of your ETL or ELT jobs or pipelines grows over time, and you you have you have really a challenge in maintaining them and and you know developing over time. So that's why the the, the, the there is a there is a so-called ELT or ETL challenge, and we try to solve it by bringing some uh, some additional features cap capabilities called Synapse Link. Synapse Link ba is based on the assumption that some of the systems could be brought into an analytical platform without without super complex managed ETL in place. Instead of that, we can connect directly to this data source, for example, SQL or Cosmos DB or Dataverse, and bring the data in much easier is in much easier way without building sophisticated pipelines and data pools. And also, it brings the data in near real time, which means that once the new data lands in the operational system, we see the data immediately or almost immediately in the analytical system, which is sometimes very, very expected. Now, I will present you with the uh, the example of one of the links. It is going to be linked for Dataverse. Now, Dataverse is a kind of storage or database behind Power Platform and some some of the Dynamics 365 solutions. So basically, if you have, for example, D365 sales CRM uh, ERP, you may you may benefit from having uh, synchronization between those systems and Dataverse uh, synchronization of data because then the data this data uh, that lands in Dataverse can be easily taken into the Synapse workspace by using Azure Synapse link for Dataverse. How does it work? It's easy to set up, you just click, and then uh, actually two things happen. One, the data and the metadata lands in the data lake. There is a separate container created for you in your, in your data lake under Azure Synapse. And then on top of this, on top of this data stored in the data lake, there is a there is a there is a metadata for SQL queries created, so you can actually treat it as a SQL database that allows you to immediately query the data using SQL. Uh, there are some limitations right now for this uh, for this approach. You have to uh, base on the same Azure AD tenant, and also you have to put uh, you have to put your your Synapse workspace and the storage behind the workspace in the same Azure region. As uh, as you have your Power Platform. Now let me let me show you how this looks like. Mm -hmm. So to start playing with data with this uh, Synapse link for Dataverse, you have to go to Power Apps, Power Power Apps portal. Then you have this Dataverse option, and you can start with Azure Synapse link. I already have one created, so I will just go through the process and not create another one. Uh, I will just show you the process and the, and what's the what's the outcome of the process. So let's create a new link. First, you have you have to decide whether you're going to connect only only uh, to Data Lake or you want to connect also to the Synapse Analytics workspace. If you want to have database that will be allowed uh, to to uh, to immediate qu SQL queries, you will you will select this option: connect to your Azure Synapse Analytics workspace. Now, the only thing you have to choose is the subscription, the Azure subscription, then the resource group, then the workspace name, and the storage account. And then all you have to do is to select tables that are stored in the Dataverse 
that you will that you will want to uh, synchronize with with Synapse and, and the data lake under Synapse. So, for example, if I want to uh, if I want to synchronize the vendor table, all I need to do is to search for this table and just simple simple select this this table. There are also some advanced advanced options like, for example, uh, whether I want to partition data. Uh, or, or for example, whether I, whether I want to only append new rows coming to to the table, I will not play with those options. But just for you to know, do not miss this advanced this advanced button here. If I want, if I try to save it, it will actually not allow me because I already have one Synapse link created between this specific Power Apps uh, environment and the and the Azure Synapse uh, environment. So I will rely on existing one, but. For your information, this actually synchronizes a single vendor table, which will be needed for me uh, for for my lake house in the future. Now, the effect on the Synapse side is the following. First of all, if you look at the data hub linked, you will notice there is an additional uh, container created in your data lake. In this in this container, there are a bunch of different different uh, files, but here you have uh, some kind of metadata model stored in JSON format, and then your data stored in a CSV file. So it's it's as simple as that. And then on top of that, I have a lake database created, which is called pretty much the same as the container name, where I can find the table CRF vendor. And guess what? I can immediately query that and here we are in the in the SQL experience of Synapse, which is based on the serverless experience. And I will get to that in a second. So you can run a query on top of your uh, data that comes from Dataverse straight to Synapse. And as you can see, there are some there are some meaningful rows to query and maybe maybe integrate with other systems. Now. Let's move to the processing of data. So once I have this data in a data lake, either brought by pipelines or by or, or by uh, Synapse link, I can analyze the data and model and, and, and serve the data in a meaningful way. There are two SQL experiences. Serverless, which is always present, always enabled. It always exists. It's it's actually charged by, ter by, uh, by terabytes of data queried. One terabyte costs $5, which is not expensive. And there is dedicated SQL pool, which I will not cover today, but it's a, I would say, traditional data warehouse, uh, distributed warehousing, uh, compute power clusters that handle that can that can handle queries in a uh, quite performant way. Uh, but again, this is this is actually more well known than serverless, so I will try to focus on serverless uh, in my further demos. Also, you have Spark pool. Which is great for people coming from big data world. So you can handle you can handle data using different languages: Python, Scala, SQL, .NET, or R. And uh, for SQL experience, you will work with SQL scripts. For Spark pools, you will work with notebooks. So let's see what we can do once we have the data in the data lake. So let me just discard this. Uh, this one, and let's maybe navigate to Sandbox. So I downloaded this file into the data lake. Now I can query it using SQL or using Spark. So let's start with SQL. I can quickly select, select, uh, let's say one one hundred rows from this from this file. So I'm querying the file, and this can be done for multiple formats. Here I have very simple query. Notice this open row set. It actually contains the path to the to the file, and it says about the file format. But you can also play with different file formats. Here in developed in develop hub, I have ready to use script that does some grouping on top of my more sophisticated open open data set. Let's see what's the result. And imagine and and just just notice one thing. I I have no database. I, I didn't create any database. I have my built-in serverless SQL pool ready to query the data. So I can immediately query the data in the data lake. I'm, I'm running out of time. <laughs> so um, 
Question to Kevin, an organizer. Is it okay for me to uh, run it like five to ten minute, minutes longer? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Go for yeah, it. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I will focus on demos. Thanks. So here we can see that there is a data set that, that collects trips from uh, you know, different years or different months in, in several files. In, and in total, it has over 1.5 billion rows. And, it, and I can query this data using SQL without any database just by reaching out to Parquet files. Notice here, I'm using wildcard, wildcards. This, this star means every Parquet file in every PU month partition in every PU year. Actually, partitions are just folders. So this data is actually uh, split among different folders. But, but notice that I can, I can query not just a single file, but also a, a subset of files or even the whole data set that is stored in a single folder. And here I have also function file called filepath, which allow which allows me to find uh, what is the name of the file, for example. Uh, sorry, uh, the the value of partition the, the partitioning value for the first star I have in my in my uh, file path. This is year, and the second one file name can actually extract the file name or the or the complete path of the file. So I'm I'm good to go with playing with those files, not just to, to grab the data from the files themselves, but also to grab the metadata that describe the file path, which is great. Now for CSV file, you will use format CSV. The new, the new parser is 2.0. It actually works a bit smarter in terms of uh, schema inferring. Notice I'm not, I'm if, uh, in both queries here, and here, I'm not passing any kind of uh, schema for this data. So the schema is actually inferred automatically. So I can query the CSV files. Maybe let me show you this uh, in the bronze layer. I have sample ERP, invoices, and some, some simple CSV files that store invoices, invoice number, some description, quantity, typical, typical sales data, right? And I can query this, those files as well as Parquet files, multiple files at once, and group them to show how much revenue I get, I, I got in in specific months, right? It takes more time than for Parquet files because CSV is not that optimized for queries, but still. A quite quite time, timely fashion. Even more, I can display this data not just in tables but also in charts. So I can, for example, have my um, column chart showing me um, revenue by month, right? So I can see that hey, November was actually my best month in this history. And also, I can do the same about JSON files. Notice here, I'm using specific JSON value function to extract a piece of JSON, JSON, uh, JSON file. Let me show you this file in a, in a bronze layer. Google Analytics. Yes, this is just a simple uh, single Google Analytics file that contains some information about hits, so visits on the website. And I want to find out using this data, I want to find out what was the what was the stats uh, in terms of browsers that people used to visit my website, right? Again, simple SQL query, and I have my results. Maybe not in chart, just in table. And I can see that Chrome was the most popular. So as you can see, different formats, same technique, open rows it with different options, and then just 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 a standard SQL SQL querying, my grouping, my uh, my window functions, whatever you want. Now, the same can be performed with uh, files uh, using using Spark. Um, so you can start uh, with your sorry with your sandbox, uh, for example, and have a new new notebook that will load the data into a data frame. Data frame, you can treat it as an object that is distributed among uh, Spark uh, Spark cluster nodes. 
and that, and then processed um, in parallel by the, by several nodes, uh, so it can, it can be quite efficient. So here I have a very simple simple Python code that loads the data from my file into a new data frame that I can display. Now I I have a ready to use uh, notebook to show you with with results of a kind of exploration for this data. This is pretty much the same file, but only for June of 2022. So you can see that I can load the data, display preview of 10 files. Then I can, uh, then I can, for example, run some uh, data engineering, add, co add new columns and extract some subsets of, uh, of data from existing columns. Here I'm taking date and, and, uh, and prepare columns like month number, day of month and so forth. So I can, I can, I can actually uh, enrich my data set with additional columns like here. Uh, notice that the notebook is a mix of two things. Code, which can be Python code, but not just Python code, and Markdown, which is just a text. So you can document notebooks at the same time and have your code in it. And you can also have your results. So it's great, a great form of documentation of your uh, exploration and experiments with data. I can switch to SQL. So for example, here I'm saving my data frame as table. And yes, it's 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 actually a SQL table used by Spark. And then I can switch to SQL, uh, SQL language. And here is just a, a standard SQL. Of course, it's not T-SQL. This is uh, Spark SQL. So a bit different, but you can get used to it uh, quite soon once you have uh, T-SQL in your hands. And then I can also do some more sophisticated stuff, like, for example, data visualizations using Python libraries. So as you can see, the possibilities are quite big. Now, what was the purpose of loading all this and why I started this, uh, this conversation with modern data warehouse? Because on, at the end, you can actually do things and prepare kind of, uh, kind of uh, data warehouse. Let me show you some simple script, SQL script that prepares a logical data warehouse or a lake house, I would say, on top of data lake. So once you have all the data, all the data prepared in your lake house, you played with Spark or SQL to prepare it, you can create one of two things. Either you create views to serve this data outside of your, of your Synapse uh, environment using SQL endpoints, or you can create external tables. Here I create external table as a as a as a result of select statement. And what is actually this external table? It takes this select statement and writes writes the result of the select statement in this location in a data lake using this file format, which is of course parquet format, but encoded here. So as you can see it's quite easy to play between SQL experience and data lake experience. That's, that's why we call it actually lake house. And finally, I have, I, I cover everything that I prepared in a data lake that is ready to consume with views that then I can simply uh, ex expose to business users or people responsible for creation of Power BI reports. And yes, Power BI reports can also be, be uh, visible here in Synapse. So in develop, I can go and see Power BI. So how actually this Power BI was, uh, was connected here? If you go to manage, there is, uh, the, there is this linked, service, linked services option. And here you can create a connection to Power BI and point to the specific workspace of Power BI service. So I just point to my existing Power BI, uh, Power BI workspace called Azure Synapse plus Power BI demo, where I have a single data set and a report built on top of my Synapse data. And I create a connection here, right? I have, I have connection ready. And then I, when I switch to develop, I see Power BI reports and data sets existing in this in this um, uh, in this specific uh, Power BI workspace, and I can even open the report and play with it. So I can have this interact interactivity that Power BI normally brings into the game. 
Uh, and guess what? This report is built on top of 1.5 billion rows. It behaves quite smoothly because it actually combines the power of Power BI and the, and the fact that I can uh, use uh, partial, I can partially bring the data to Power BI, and then I can and then I can uh, play with aggregations. So here, this screen presents the aggregated the aggregated uh, format of data, and if I drill down, for example, to a single month or a single day. And I want to, for example, show this, the data for a single day, uh, some, some details. Those details can actually pass queries to uh, one of the, one of the SQL, SQL endpoints that I have in, in Synapse. So if you get back to Azure portal and check your Synapse, then for, for several SQL that I've been using for the whole presentation today, I would use this endpoint. And yes, you can copy this endpoint and use it to connect using your favorite blah, 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 blah. Yep. SQL Server Management Studio. Here I have my databases, my, my lake databases visible uh, as, a norm, as normal databases. I can see the views that I prepared, for example, to, for, cons, for consumption by Power BI. Uh, sorry, uh, it's, it was this one, New York City Taxi. And yeah, the LDW layer is my uh, is my layer of views ready to use by Power BI, which is of course uh, actually happening here in in my demo. Yeah, so I can see the details displayed by directly querying the data lake. So as you can see, there is a synergy between uh, different tools, different pieces of puzzle that Microsoft brings into the game. This is actually getting tighter. Um, Okay, what else? Well, actually, that's not the end because after you build this warehouse or and, and standardize your data, you can also bring data science into the game. Let me just show you a quick recorded demo this time. This is gonna be Synapse ML. So, so the library that we bring we bring into Synapse Spark to make to know, to make data, data science easier for people who may not have data data science experience. So here I have an image. Those are those are speakers of Data Tobogan event last year. I'm here as well, and I want to see simply OCR this image. So, the, what I'm doing here is actually I'm using uh, I'm using the Synapse ML to connect to my existing uh, cognitive services service. So I have linked service defined in Synapse workspace. I connect to image processing api i'm passing the image itself and i and i get the ocr information so once this is done it actually uh, uh, returns the, the data set that contains not only image uh, image uh, path but also it, it contains some json document with the result of my analytics and then as as you may expect i can for example save this extract this JSON file, flatten it, and, and then uh, save it to my warehouse, lake house, whatever. So it's an easy way to play with different different uh, data science, data, data science uh, parts of Azure, for example. Now, if this topic, if this topic uh, actually is interesting for you, you can easily start with ready to use architectures. This link, this image is clickable. I will, uh, I will give you uh, the link to my PDF version of this presentation in a second, or even I will I will just simply uh, put it in a in a chat. This is the easiest. This is the easier version of architecture, the one that I use today. So simply data lake, a bit of Spark, and a bit of serverless, and then Power BI on top. And this one is actually uh, if you if you zoom in and show how I build the 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 data flow. It was just like this. I ingested the data in a bronze layer, then I moved through silver layer to curate the data and gold layer to present the data in a, a ready to use star schema. And then I consumed the data from Power BI using serverless SQL pool. And that's actually it. I have a bunch of, bunch of uh, community resources for you, so you can use this slide. It's actually available under aka.ms synapse community resources. You can download it or just grab it from my PDF file. 
Let me just quickly put the PDF file in the chat window so you will be able to download it, hopefully. Um, yes or no? <laughs> if not, I will just send it to Kevin and uh, you may make it available for uh, la later download. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just send it to me. That'll be perfect. Yeah. So my 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 advice to you, if you want to start with Synapse, use our YouTube channel. There are some quick start videos. Uh, we have a series called, uh, I'm not sure what it's called, Azure Synapse 101 or Quick Start probably. So or, or Essentials, yeah, Essentials, where we where we present very basic stuff, like just, just what I showed you today, where maybe today was a bit farther than just than just basics and then you can you can start with dozens of tutorials that we have in documentation so those those uh, those resources here on the right side might be useful for you as well and um if you have questions i'm open for you for you to to run to run all, all of your questions of course there are some pieces missing in this presentation like for example how to handle you know, delta and coming changes to the data. But uh, the the way we handle that in ideal case is we use we use Synapse Spark and Delta Delta format to store the data in at least uh, silver and, and gold layer of the data lake. So the, those two that we typically grant access to uh, to users. So things to remember data lake as a baseline. It's not always about relational databases only, but SQL experience at the end is the one that you use to access the data. Spark can be quite powerful in terms of data manipulation. Uh, pipelines are for orchestrating. You can also put uh, notebooks as part of your pipelines, so you can code and then run this code as a part of your uh, data flows. And use open formats. Parquet. I've, I've been using Parquet for the whole presentation, but Delta is something that you should also pay pay attention to. Okay. Cool. Questions. Questions. <laughs> so I'm sure you, sure people have questions, but they're all just being shot at the moment. I do not have any questions actually in the chat. Oh, sorry, At that very moment, we get a we get a request from David. <laughs> How would you How validate would you your dimension it? data exists when loading your facts into Synapse? So, uh, you know, actually, I would orchestrate it in pipelines because pipelines work just like you historically played with SQL Server integration services. So you can you can put uh, steps in a pipeline in a way that uh, next step is based on the success criteria for the follow for the preceding step. So uh, you basically uh, put some kind of control over the process. Hey, I was I successfully loaded or or updated the dimension, and finally I, I can update my my fact table. Yes, that's we still uh it, it it's 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 modern it's based on data lake yet we still base on the same rules in terms of data modeling so thank you for this question it is actually a great question we still we still rely on old old fashioned uh, approaches like kimball uh, data vault in some cases uh, inmon if you prefer but uh, anyway we we end up typically we end up with some kind of star or snowflake schema uh, at the very front layer of, of synapse uh, whatever you have there thanks so yes i would put it in pipeline and make the next step dependent on the previous one and make facts that uh, dependent on dimensions awesome if anyone else has any questions now is the time to get them in absolutely and from the dba perspective do not do not uh, do not uh, get um, uh, misled by this presentation. It's not that everything is managed by Microsoft here. There are a bunch of things to manage. For example, you have to manage cost, which is uh, which requires lots of monitoring under the hood. I, I, I just wanted to focus on analytics here and not on the costs, but uh, imagine that each query is actually uh, is, is actually generating costs. so you have to handle that, right? And typically, we rely on the pattern that uh, if, if you use several SQL, you load the data in the data lake, then present this, this SQL interface to data. 
and then if possible load load as much data as possible into your bi systems and try to disconnect from serverless serverless used for some uh, heavy queries uh, that reach that have to aggregate and reach out reach out to the historical data rather than uh, run every single query on top of your servers because that will just generate cost right exactly so with that it doesn't look like we have any more questions so we want to thank you all for coming to this week's thing about from Papa. that was very informative i know i learned a few things so all good there just make your, just make yourself comfortable in, and try synapse uh and, and until you enable things like dedicated sql pool or heavy spark pools or you have petabytes of data in your data lake this is not gonna be expensive just try it yep uh, so with that uh please remember to join us <coughs> next time on actually Valentine's Day, February 14th, when we're going to talk about security with John Deirdre. So with that, Pavel, thank you so much for this presentation. I had a great time. So with that, thank you all very much for coming and we'll talk to you all next time. Thanks for having me and see you all. Thank you.